Good afternoon, everyone. How did you enjoy that video? We've, we've had a lot of activities going on over the last few years, and uh, certainly last year as well. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Meditation Museum. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. And today we have a wonderful program on self-liberation. We have a very special guest, Minu Marielle, who, who will join us shortly. And she and Sister Jenna will talk about tools of self-empowerment and self-liberation and why miracles are the norm rather than the exception. So we have a very interesting program ahead. Now I'd like to introduce Sister Jenna. Sister Jenna is the founder and director of the Brahma Kumaris Meditation Museum in Silver Spring here and also in Virginia. And she also hosts the America Meditating Radio Show. And our special guest, Minu Marielle, she's the author of the international number one bestseller entitled The Bee Book, which is a journey into miracles and a guide to self-liberation. And she's also the founder of the Poin Foundation, which is a non-governmental organization whose mission is to make miracles the norm and restore dignity for all. And so now I'd like to welcome um, my new uh, Marielle. Hello and welcome. Just going to turn around. So what I'd like to do is uh, to begin with a, a, a brief interactive exercise, even before I introduce uh, and tell you anything at all about who I am and what my journey is. Um, and what I would like to do is to start by introducing this whole idea about listening. You know, we all have listening filters. So if I was to stand up here and say, I'm Minu Mariel and I'm a politician, you know, your listening filter for whatever that is for a politician will come down. And from that point on, anything I say, you will be listening to it from that filter of a politician. So I may sit here and lead you through a meditation or whatever, but your filter will keep coming in the way, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to just have you work in pairs just to illustrate the power of this, this filter and how you can work beyond it. And that will just set us up for the rest of the workshop. Is that okay? So just choose your partner and choose an A and a B. Okay. Would you? Okay, everybody has a partner? Everybody has a partner? Yes? Who's, uh, just A is put up your hand. A is put up your hand. Choose an, okay, A, are you partnering? Your A, okay, A. Okay, so A, you're gonna do the talking and B, you're gonna do the listening, okay? So A, you're going to talk about something that you're completely passionate about, something that really sings to your heart, something that you just would wake you up, lights you up, right? Now B, you're gonna do the listening. And you're going to listen to A as if A is just a, a complete waste of space, causing noise pollution, taking up your time, you know, and you just want to go somewhere it's more interesting. And this A is going on, blah, 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 blah. It's not personal. So, you know, just really act it out, you know, just put on your actor suit on and really act it out. So A, speak with complete passion and B, listen to A as if A is a complete waste of time and you just need to get away somewhere. Okay, let's begin. I'm <laughs> 
very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's come back. Let's come back. Okay, B, it's your turn now. And you're going to do the talking. And you're going to talk about something really mundane, you know, like you woke up in the morning and you, you know, had a glass of water, decided to brush your teeth and, you know, whatever it could be, right? Something really mundane. And A, you're going to listen to B as if B is your Nelson Mandela. <laughs> B is this amazing, inspiring leader you've been waiting for. Every word that comes out, there could be a nugget of wisdom in the fact that B is even talking to you is like, wow, such a privilege. All right? Let's begin. B. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give yourself a round of applause. Okay, let's just uh, get some feedback on what that was like. So A is when you were talking about something you're passionate about and being listened to as a complete waste of space. What was that like for the A's? <laughs> it was, uh, it, yes, okay. yes. Yeah, it was, um, it reinforced for me um, my vocation as a poet. So it just, it doesn't matter to me what anybody else thinks about it. So, and then it, it was kind of hard because we were kind of getting on a little bit. When I saw that she wasn't very interested, I tried to think, well, let me switch gears and talk about something else that I like to do. Yes, yes. I actually, when she was talking to me, I wanted to behave as if I don't care or it doesn't interest me. But unfortunately, what she was talking about was really interesting. I may not behave any other way, but we do. <laughs> it did bother me when I was pouring my heart out to him and he was like paying me yeah. no attention. It, I felt it. It bothered me. Yeah, yeah. From here, just sitting sitting here, um, I had to like literally stop because it was starting to get really heavy, you know. And there you were talking about something you're passionate about, you know, and you, you started thinking about or maybe I should talk about something else, right? We'll come to that in a minute. So bees, when you were being listened to as this, as the Nelson Mandela, what was that like for the bees? Um, you feel special, like what you're saying is really important because you can all this attention, you can yeah. see they really um, putting it all into what you're saying. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, the, the, the focus, you know, when you're looking at somebody eye to eye and the focus on, you know, on you as you speak, you know, instead of mm -hmm. all over the world. Right. Yes. Anybody else wants to share? Yes. And you felt really good about it, and you felt that somebody was engaged with what you were saying. Yes, yes. Now, the, thank you very much for sharing all of that. For Can we try that again? Okay, you try that again. <laughs> Well, you know, you can do that all the time. That was, you're actually talking about the conclusion of what I'm about to say. You know, this, this session is about self-liberation. And one of the keys to self-liberation is really knowing that you have the power. You know, as, and listening is, is one of the first things that gives you that power. Through your listening, you can completely transform how the other person is responding to you, how they are performing, how they are coming across. You have the power to give them the strength or take that strength away. You know? Just by the way you were listening to the A's as a waste of space, they started, they were, and they were talking about something they're passionate about. They started, you know, finding other things to talk about. You know, it's not that they're not passionate about what they're talking about, but just the way you were listening to them 
actually shifted something for them, you know? Now bees, you were talking about something mundane and then you wanted to elaborate and expand on that because of the way you were being listened to. That is the power we have. You know, so, so and, and I would say this would be one of the first things to take on and your point about, let's try that again. Do it all the time. Do it all the time. Each one of us is born with our own unique strength. We are, in our own way, the most amazing teacher we could possibly have. You know, as a soul, we have gone through so many journeys, through many, many lifetimes, and all of that has accumulated, and we are born with that knowledge and wisdom. It's only a matter of connection. And the way you, so this, the first point is just really know that this listening filter is an artificial thing that we've created. In the workplace, and I used to be a corporate executive and then embarked on, on, on a journey, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But you know, I remember in, our, in the corporate world, there were certain people in the team who were high performers, there were certain who were lazy people. I mean, there were all, this is all this thing that we made up. So when this lazy person is walking towards my office, I would think, okay, now what does this person want? Or there was this complaining one, and there was this, you know? And the, the really high performance ones are very rarely came and spoke to me, and they would be the ones that would get most of the things to do. But it was all to do with my listening. So this person who I had labeled as lazy, actually, you know, they were a master of many, many abilities that I never ever gave them a chance to display just because of the way I was listening to them. So they had no chance. You saw it just within a matter of a minute, you were talking to someone you didn't necessarily even know and you shifted their performance just by the way you listened to them in a matter of few minutes. That's the power that we have. And just knowing that we hold that power is a big key to self-liberation. So I invite you today, and you know, it's, just, it's the first day of the rest of your life, you know, just start listening beyond the filters. And the moment anything comes in, which is like an already always, uh, you know, assumption, step out of it and start listening to the person like you did, the, you know, like, a, like the Nelson Mandela, and see what shows up. <coughs> you know, just brushing your teeth suddenly became so interesting. <laughs> Right? And you actually, and really what was happening was you were honoring the person, regardless of what was coming out of their mouth. And as you were honoring them, you felt good about yourself too, right? Just listening to someone in that way and seeing them shine. It became a beautiful honoring exchange. Again, a great propeller to self-liberation. What is, the, and what is the other side of self-liberation? It really is feeling as if you have, you have to, you should do, you need to, you know, conform to this, that, and the other, right? As if there is some pressure on you. But you can shift that by, I mean, there's so many people we listen to. Well, switch it, just by shifting your listening. If we just did that one thing for, as a result of today, that would be a big transformation. And you've practiced it. So you've created a little memory, you know. In yoga we say we always create a little cellular memory so you can return to that space. You've experienced it. So have a go when you go on from here. So yes, my name is Minu Marielle. Um, and my journey began in India. I was born and brought up in India and um, India is a beautiful spiritual place. It also is the best training ground for the competitive world. So I was born to a spiritual mom. I was brought up by my grandparents in North India where Lord Krishna was born. And I had this strange habit of exploring underground passages and old palaces and old temples uh, for, as a young child. And I discovered lots of wonderful surprises, like you know, you would go in in one place and then come out 
you know, across the river and all sorts of wonderful experiences like that. Um, and then I went to college and you know, university in, in Bombay and got trained very well for the competitive world, moved to live in London uh, via Saudi Arabia and uh, I was very well prepared to take on the Western world being trained in the way I was. Uh, so I did that, you know, it was, became a high-flying executive working at the top echelons of industry. And something started happening to me from, you know, about 47 onwards. I started feeling a hollowness uh, and just didn't understand what that was. Um, and in India, I grew up with a fa in a in a cultural background. We were Hindus, but we actually worshipped the elements. So we never had the concept of following a guru. So it never even occurred to me to find a guru. Um, I just felt the hollowness. Didn't know how to talk about it. And one thing led to another. I had a uh, over several years this feeling of emptiness within, looking for meaning and not being able to talk about it became deeper and stronger and I had a health crisis and it, through that health crisis through guidance of a friend I was, I was guided to go away for three weeks and really just connect to who I am and what I want to do next. Because of the health crisis I was literally pushed to make a choice and I chose to go to Bali and uh, that's where I connected to the next phase of my life was about living an extraordinary life where all aspects of my life can coexist with ease, grace and joy. I realized that the hollowness came from years and years of conforming, years and years of feeling that I have to, I should do, juggling, you know, a, a home and work and single parenthood and all sorts of stuff. Um, feeling I was doing, I was succeeding, and then there's somewhere else, something else would, would take priority. I was just like, really got myself into a world that seemed to be moving, moving, moving all the time. And I was, found myself as if I was a hamster wearing multiple suits on multiple wheels and spinning, 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 but returning back to the same place. So being in Bali, you know, once I made the choice to go to Bali, literally the universe conspired in a way that it, or, you know, the universe does. Um, I was the only guest in this resort for two out of the three weeks. It, they had 14 cancellations in the week before I arrived. It had never happened in the history of the resort. And, and I believe it truly was the universe supporting me. Because if there was one other person in the resort, we would have gone sightseeing and we might have done some tours together. And here I was by myself, so I decided to just stay in there and the health wasn't that great, but it, it, what it did was I was the only guest. Balinese people, if you've been to Bali, you would know they love to serve. So I was the only guest, so all the staff was serving me, you know, they would bring, they would see where I was, someone would come and want to massage my feet. And initially, like, you know, I was very, very English, if you like, you know, I had 29 years in England. So I said, oh, no, 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 thank you, no, thank you, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I saw the hurt in their eyes so out of obligation, I opened myself up to let them, you know, serve me. But really what it did was it opened me up to receiving, you know, and I realized now with, with hindsight that in being so wonderful at the do race and winning it everywhere, I had actually stopped receiving. So there was very little time for celebration. I, I worked in an organization which really worked at very high levels of government, so we had this very special training that was given. And the special training included things like, you know, if you ever feel you have anything to defend, you attack. Attack is the best form of defense. You do not smile, you do not apologize, all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> over the years of in that, that corporate brainwashing, all of that had disappeared. And here were these sweet, sweet Balinese people. They smile and they smile with every cell and there they were serving me. And initially it was like I had to receive it. But really what it did was it opened me up to receiving. And that opened me up to allowing myself to just be. And that then, that whole journey, you know, it's, it's laid out in the B book 
which is available on Amazon. We weren't able to get a contingent of books here in time, but you can certainly go on Amazon and, and, and buy it from there. That allowed me to learn to just be. And I was in Bali, surrounded by nature, surrounded by beautiful butterflies and bees and these wonderful people. And there I was learning to just relax and be. Nature started contributing to me. And I understood the power of nature. You know, nature is always in its truth. It just is, you know? I got that the vibration of trees is a vibration of okayness, you know? And, and I would sit around just allowing the trees to envelop me in their okayness, you know? Because as human beings and the kind of societies we live in, it's not okay to be okay. It has to be extreme, you know? Devastation or complete ecstatic elation. And people who are sort of in, in the middle are like, you know, it's just not okay. But okayness is such, gives you such strength. You know, you can chop a tree, the tree does, still is okay. Because it's still serving in some way. It knows, it remains in its truth, it does not compromise on its truth, no matter what. I started becoming comfortable with discomfort. Because initially it was very discomforting, you know, to even just be. It was like, what do I do now? What do I do now? Well, actually, there was nothing to do but to just stop hanging there, you know? And it, it opened me up to learn meditation. It opened me up to learn to breathe and, you know, feel the, feel the flow of breath and all of that, oh, something happened and as if a treasure trove opened up and I started writing. And initially it would be on my iPhone, on the notes. I would just something, I just knew I had a download and I would just write. And then initially it was like, oh God, am I getting schizophrenic? What's happening? Where is this stuff coming from? And after several days of struggling with that, I realized, well, what I've written is actually profound, you know? What does it matter where it's coming from? What if I just implemented it? Now, that connection would not have happened if I wasn't in Bali and I hadn't become comfortable with allowing the opening up to this wisdom. It could be my own inner wisdom. It could be channeled wisdom. Whatever it was happened because I opened myself up to receiving, you know? And it, so that really became the start of my journey into miracles and my journey into self-liberation. And I would like to share a few of very practical nuggets and insights that you can also work with from here. And before I do that, I'd like to welcome Sister Jenna. <laughs> and I would like to thank her for hosting me here. And thanks to the whole team that has put this together at such a short notice. Wasn't she amazing? <laughs> So that you've called me up, what would you like me to do? Well, I think it would be great. You are such an amazing dialogue creator. Okay. You know? uh, so I would love to share some insights about self-liberation. Yes. yes. Um, and I would just allow you to create sure. the flow. Sure. Well, thank you. Om Shanti. Good afternoon. Is everyone feeling liberated yet? Semi-liberated? Half liberated, quarter liberated. In every one of the Brahma Kumari's meditation centers across the world, it's in 120 places, we listen to the same class for a million students. Can you imagine that? Talk about order. And in today's class, there was a big emphasis on to the extent that you can become aware of knowledge, of wisdom, of yourself, to that extent, you'll be free of the bondages of illusion. Mm. To the extent that you become aware of yourself, to that extent, you will become free from the bondages of illusion. Mm. It offers us some food for thought. That um, I think what Minu has been sharing about is the importance of self-reflection and looking more at ourselves to see 
in what areas in our consciousness are we possibly missing? And you heard about her story of being, you know, entrepreneurship and her journey throughout life. And, you know, it's been her own challenge. She's had her own challenges. But that point to me that really touched my heart was when you really started to move towards where's my place of being here? Where do I start to access my state of being? And we have gotten very accustomed to the doing mode, right? We're very comfortable in doing. But my brother here, um, Naveen, who's visiting us from Arkansas and um, where was were you in Dallas, and now he's with us in Richmond, Virginia, he said he was helping out at a retreat center up in Dallas. And it was away from everyone. And guess what he said? And there was no Wi-Fi, <laughs> which was the biggest, which is a big issue. You know, when you don't have Wi-Fi, you're stuck with yourself, isn't it? <laughs> He was stuck with himself by default. And so what was it like, what was that turning point for you when you started to look more into your state of being rather than all the doing that you were accomplishing in the world? Well, the first thing I really got was um, even the being became a doing. You know, I was like doing, noticing myself being mm -hmm. and became really very doing oriented. And that became another race. Yeah, yeah. And it was, um, in some ways it was good, because I did it with such intensity. Uh, and by that point, in, in Bali, I had gotten to, I want to live an extraordinary life, where all aspects of my life coexisted. And I could see that being was essential, but I also wanted that extraordinary life. Right. So I was with great intensity, I was doing the being stuff. Um, and that it meant that within a couple of days, I really got to see that I had added the being part to my to-do list, you know? Mm. So something big had to shift. This to-do list, there, there, there was a new incarnation or a reinvention of this list stuff that was driving me that needed to shift. Right. And I, I uncovered the joy of creating a B list instead. And that was the breaking point. That literally cracked open the coconut or the kernel, if you like. So give me some of you your know? B lists. What were so, some of your Bs on your list? Yeah, so it was like, you know, how about having a B list instead? You know, create a B word and choose to be that that day. I understood that doing flows because we are just, we have we become a creature of doing. You know, so doing flows anyway. If we create a B, uh, choose our B word for the day. So for example, if I chose that I'm going to be joyful today, it was important to define what joyful actually means. So joyful for me is where I'm smiling a lot. You know, I'm just, and, I, and I'm aware of my smiles. Really feeling, experience, smiling a lot, feeling, experiencing my smiles. And I get on with my day, start nice. doing stuff. Nice. And just like you have in the Brahma Kumaris, that, that one hour, you know, traffic control. Traffic control. Traffic control. So I had my traffic control set up. Nice. And that my traffic control was really just checking in on how many things I happened in that last hour that actually made me smile. Wow. And then smiling about that. Would you say that perhaps many of us in the room and those watching also on Facebook Live, is it really the effort is the balance? Because uh, I remembered meeting a guru, Swami Vedanta. Um, mm. He's moved on now. And Swami said one of the greatest acts that we can perform for ourselves is to be experts at dooby 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 dooby. Got it? Do and be. Do and be. Become a dooby expert. Wasn't that nice? I always remember that. Because if I'm being too much, I'm going to feel out of balance. But if I'm doing too much, I'm going to feel out of balance. Did, did you find yourself on your journey able to hit your balance mark mm -hmm. where even though on your to-do list was to be, yeah. uh, were you able to find your balance? You know, what I learned, <clears throat> as, as I got into the whole B-list stuff and allowed the doing to flow, I also... A couple of other things I became aware of, you know, things like behave. 
actually is, we say behave, right? But actually it is be and you have. That's what behave means. If you keep doing, you may or may not have. And if you did have, you won't even notice it. You will keep going. It takes you out of balance. Yeah. So it's really, it's a, I, saw, I, heard, I, I saw that. I thought, oh my god, this is phenomenal. And then there was because, right? A justification for whatever, right? <laughs> it actually is a, is a sentence, because, period. So it got me to say, ah, if I can be a cause, Right? That literally lifts me above the reactiveness of any situation. Because I'm, I'm, I'm standing for a cause beyond stuff. I'm not going to waste my time sitting there justifying this, that, and the other. I be cause. And so that's where the balance comes in. So B is the secret to actually achieving the balance because we are a creature of doing. We will, doing will flow anyway. Most of us are at a point where we pretty much know what we are to do, but we allow ourselves to go on these drunken walks where we start reacting and responding to this, that, and the other, or we feel we have to, we have to, or we need to, and we get away from our path. So my hope, that this is what I got. That's where the balance comes in when you choose to be. Just even understanding, you know, like believe, is actually meant to be be live. You know, we have these aha moments. We hear these amazing insights, but then we don't bring them alive. So believe is all about be live. <laughs> so it's interesting to know these things and then operate from that. Balance comes in. It's a given. Yeah. So let's, let's start with be live. <laughs> I like that one because um, we are souls and we are here to live out a part whether we know it or not, whether it's preordained or we think we're putting it in there. Um, it, it surprises me that sometimes we know better, but we don't always do better. Like you wonder if there's something pushing me to be who I've become without even me playing a role in it, even though we think we're making the choices and making the decisions and, and doing it. At what point would you like to share with us um, where we really need to listen mm -hmm. to our state of being more because we do get off track mm -hmm. and we do hear a lot of other sounds outside of us and we're in a world that being is not on the top chart of a priority and we have to find ways to find our state of being to find freedom so any advice that you can offer us today, Minu, where we really are looking for some steps that we can take practically hmm. to give us signals when we're getting off track, one, or how to better amplify our state of being in, in a balanced mode when the world is always telling us, look outside, look outside, look hmm. outside. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll use this question as a way of really sharing two or three insights for self-liberation because uh, your question really leads me to do that. Uh, how do you know that you're getting off track? If you find yourself, you know, um, even thinking that, oh, I, um, I love doing this, but let me just, I have to do this first. So the moment you have a have to or should that comes in, you know that you're now entering that realm. It's a start of a drunken walk. So instead of going diagonally from where you are to where you want to get to in terms of you know, whatever it is that you stand for, whatever it is that gives you joy, the moment you start feeling that you have to, that is the start. So at that point, it may be completely legitimate that you, ha you, that you are required to do something. Um, what I say to people is this is where you use the, the B word thing, you know, just really step in to be proactive about it. You know, you choose your B word. Sometimes it's hard to go in and, you know, find even your state of being. So uh, my whole thing is I found my state of being by actually proactively choosing to create a B word and allowing that to create the context within which the content of my day happened, you know. And that then really led me to connect with what the calling of my soul is. 
I, I didn't go into, I just didn't know how, you know, Sister Jenna, I just had to find ways in which that I could implement that made sense to me. So really important to know that by a practical action is choose the B word, sets the context for the content that is going to flow. How do you shift the content and the experiences that you have throughout the day? We've looked at the listening side. Listen to yourself as your Nelson Mandela. Listen to yourself. You are this powerful being that you would love to, to meet and revere. Meet yourself that way. There's a practical exercise that you could also do, which is a, you know, a, a third point that I say to people. It's a very simple one. It literally is, you know, go in the mirror and look at yourself in the mirror and smile. I love that one. And smile, and what I want you to do next is swallow that smile. And as that smile, I just swallow that smile, literally just swallow, smile and swallow. That <laughs> smile literally just goes down your digestive tract, right? And as it's doing, it literally goes down your spine and it's just sm getting all of your cells to smile. It's bringing that remembrance of smile back into your being. Just try it, it's pretty powerful, you know? Uh, and then smile again. At this point, your cells are smiling, not just your mouth or your eyes, right? So this is something that is, I love starting my day with it. Swallow okay. your smile, smile tomorrow. Swallow your smile and smile again. Like and it that. literally just opens it does. Yes, it does, doesn't it? It's yeah. pretty powerful. It's very powerful. <laughs> um, and this is a really great way. If you're going to have, if you're going to meet someone who has a bit of an edge, or someone who might put you in the, in you know, on the wrong track, do this. Smile, <coughs> swallow your smile, smile again. And literally, what happens is when you meet this person, their cells are receiving the smile of your cells. It isn't just a smile from your mouth that's happening. And that's a very different level of connection. A couple so, more things could I share sure. as insights? Because I was just about to share what my B word was. Yes, I, well, I came sure. up with B side. Because <laughs> we're next to each other, then we're going to be doing things together. It can be small. Yeah. It doesn't have to be too elevated. Oh, She's beside me. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, that was my B word today. <laughs> yes. Um, so an, another, another insight which supports the self-liberation quest is knowing that whatever you give energy to, you get more of. So if you're going through a phase in your life where you know, there's an undertone of worry or anxiousness or whatever, there is somewhere in your being you're giving energy to that. And that's what you're getting more of. Right? Now, once you get that understanding, it's a good aha to have. How do you shift it with ease, joy, and grace? So I say to people, look at what, what is it that you want more of. Don't, don't try and change the stuff. It's hard work. If you look at what is it that you want more of, that's, you know, it's, that's easier to get your head around. What is it that you want more of? That's the first step. Then look at different times in your life where you might have had that. You know, it might be as a child, it might be an interaction with a loved one, it might be, uh, you know, just lying in the bath, in the Epsom salt bath, or whatever it is. Just find where that reality of what you want more of exists. And all you have to do is to keep giving energy to what you want more of and connecting your brain to where this has occurred for you in the past or where you see it in somebody else and it gives you joy to see that. Now, why I'm asking you to do this, and just stop at that, don't, don't go into any other greater processing, because the universe is really at, in service to us. It is the best, the best servant, and you know, I'm talking about in service that we have, our own personal, um, you know, person who's serving us and serving all our needs. 
and it has one expertise and it is an expert in that expertise which is to multiply whatever it is that we are vibrating like right so the moment all you have to do is get yourself into a higher attunement of vibration the universe automatically multiplies it and i always say to people be aware of your undertones so this point about what are you giving energy to, whatever you, you're giving energy to is what you get more of. So if you have an undertone of worry or if you have a full-blown anxiety attack, you're giving energy to that. That's why you're having more of that because the universe multiplies it. That's all it knows to do. And it does it really well. You know. So even if in little ways you can get yourself to a point where... You know, you know what you want more of, and you're finding one, two, three, four examples where you've experienced it, the universe catches on to that and multiplies that. And you start having more incidents and situations that will, that will give you what you want more of. So here's how I'm decoding that at a personal level, that our thoughts matter. Yeah. And it's so important for us to be able to identify where this thought that I'm having is going to take me. That's one. And the other aspect is to recognize what you said, Minu, that whatever you're feeding on a thought level, automatically, vibrationally, and on a collective level, it's going to come full-fledged towards you. Let's take, for example, um, in a relationship with maybe a spouse, or a partner or a companion, that you find yourself going through this cyclical you know, repetition. I thought I had done with, I thought I was done with this. Why am I attracting the same people but with different names and different places at different times? Or this is like the same vibration that I'm walking back into and I thought I was over with it. So that becomes my signal that there's a thought, as, as Mina was saying, What's at your base? What's your underlying area of thinking that you're serving without even realizing it? And I think one of the ways that we can check ourselves, if we can't check ourselves subtly, is to see what's happening outside of me in terms of my environment, relationships, finance, how I'm able to take a negative situation and make it positive, despite whatever's going on. So you know, all of that will show me like where am I in my thinking and my quality of thoughts. So it, it makes me think because we spoke earlier, and I guys have to tell you how I even met Mainu in a minute, but we spoke earlier in, in, in the office that there's this, we all are walking with sanskaras. What we call sanskaras are the deep impressions of our past. But they're also impressions of who we really are also mixed up in that basket. So th imagine this. Sitting in the soul, as you're looking at me through your two eyes, I'm talking to your soul, not your eyes. And sitting inside of you are your original recordings, your real truth. Actually, who you've always wanted to be despite what culture, society, media, family, friends have told you. But there are these other impressions that I've adapted to too. The anger, the greed, the attachment, the jealousy, the competition, the complaint, the criticism, the expectations, the egos. It should have been like this. It should have. You know you can never do a should have, right? Now, here my question is to you, Minu Ben, is as we are dealing with this nice little basket of caboodles, my truth is sitting in me, but also part of me that no longer needs serving. But now that's become so normalized that I don't even know how to be my truth, which is my liberated self, right? In Raj Yoga meditation, we use the connection to the Supreme Source, God. You know you go to every BK center and it has that. Are there any suggestions that you have? What is it that can help us to access that deeper part of us mm. where the real change can happen because there are two ways that we keep changing quickly, tragedy or falling in love. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how often do you fall in love, FYI, in a lifetime? How often do you fall out of love? That's another question. Mm -hmm. But how much do we have to wait for tragedy to shift my gears? 
and put me back in check. Mm. And is that the pattern that I want to get used to to activate my self liberation? Mm. So, any ideas as to how we can access the yes. deep layer of who we are, the sans those sanskaras, yes. and get us more uh, acclimated to my original self, my liberated self? Mm. How can I get used to feeling liberated and use that part of me more? Yes. So, there are two, two um, answers I would like to give uh, to support that. The first one is uh, a very simple breathing practice. And that breathing practice basically aligns what I call, as we have three brains, mind brain, heart brain, and a gut brain. The mind brain is the brain that is about survival. And it is, it is driven by past and future. It's, the, it's a brain that comes into activation when this human body is formed. The heart brain is the brain that the heart is also connected to all the organs, just like our mind, just like our brain and the head is. The heart brain operates in the now, and it's only about the now, 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 now. It's not affected by the past or the future, it's only in the now. You can imagine what will happen if the heart was affected by past and future. We'll all be dead, right? It just stays in the now, 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 very present. So heart is our connection to our full presence in this human body. Our gut, which is our colon, is the custodian of our in a wisdom that has been gathered through all our soul's journeys. And the, the colon is also connected to all the organs, just like our heart is, just like our, our brain and the head is. So once you get, so whilst the mind feels it's running the show, it's all about survival, you know? And it, the mind is doing a great job, you know? So what I say to people, and it's helped me enormously and everybody that I, I, I share this with, Get your mind, your heart, and your gut aligned. And it's a very simple breathing practice, and we'll do five such breaths just now so that you get used to the rhythm of it. It's something you can do very easily. What it does is it allows the mind to know that it's, it's a part of three brothers. It ha doesn't have to be the only one making your choices and decisions. So if you ever feel out of sorts or feel you know, really overwhelmed or whatever it may be, or even even just before the Raja Yoga meditation, just getting the three aligned just gets you in your center. And that's where you, that coexistence of what has, what has been learned in this human form and where our soul has come from starts to live together and a yin and yang starts to happen. Because one or the other is not necessarily in the best service of us. We really require that yin-yang balance of both, you know. So shall we try that? OK. So it's, a, it's basically a, a breathing pattern where you breathe in to the count of nine, hold to the count of four, and breathe out to the count of six. OK? And we're going to do it with your eyes closed just so that you get into the rhythm of it. But you need to be able to do this even with your eyes open, because sometimes you know you may be rushing somewhere and rushing somewhere else, and you just want to get back into your center. You need to be able to do it by while walking, <laughs> okay? But I'm just giving you this so you get into the rhythm of it, okay? So just sit back, relax, back supported, and you can close your eyes, and you just imagine that the base of your spine is connected to the core of the earth, and it's this core of the earth, the connection to the core of the earth is done through a golden cord. And it's like a vacuum suction pump, if you like, and it's really taking out of your field and your body any excess energy buildups that are no longer in service of you and you're feeling clearer and clearer and clearer. And as this is occurring, just allow yourself to take four, let's just take five regular breaths. And we're now going to begin our alignment breath, is what I call it. So we're about to begin our alignment breath. You're going to breathe into the count of nine, hold to the count of four, and breathe out to the count of six. So let's begin. Breathe into the count of nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hold to the count of four, two, three, four. Breathe out to the count of six, two, three, four, five, six. 
Breathe into the count of nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hold to the count of four, two, three, four. Breathe out to the count of six, two, three, four, five, six. Breathe into the count of nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hold to the count of four, two, three, four. Breathe out to the count of six, two, three, four, five, six. Breathe into the count of nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hold to the count of four, two, three, four. Breathe out to the count of six, two, three, four, five, six. Breathe into the count of nine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hold to the count of four, two, three, four. Breathe out to the count of six, two, three, four, five, six. And just take five regular breaths. And then take your hands in front of your heart and you just rub them against each other. And put your left hand over your heart and your right hand over your throat. We're just connecting the heart chakra to the throat chakra. And this whole alignment is going to start communicating through you. Your eyes are open. Open your eyes gently. Okay, and then just take your hands on either side. And what I want you to do is to get into an alignment in integration posture. So cross your feet a bit like that. And then cross your hands and just put them on your lap. Cross your feet and put your hands on your lap. And what this is doing is it's really integrating the left and the right brain. So, you know, you don't have to do it every time. We're doing it now. So we've actually made the connection of this alignment cellular memory that we just created here. So that is there with you all the time. The moment you begin your 946 breaths from now on any time, your left and right brain are integrated and you will get into your center really quickly. Okay, so just get back. Great, relax. So that's a very quick, practical thing that you can do. We love quick fixes in DC. <laughs> Thank you. Antonia, do we have any questions from the audience? One second. Sure. Any questions from the audience? Oh, Diane. Okay, that's a good question. Is this all leading up to um, miracles? Okay. So what it is doing is, uh, so here's, here's an important thing to understand. You know, my, the calling of my soul is to connect humans and humanity to the miracle that they are. So a miracle, it's important to define what a miracle is. A miracle is where something beautiful occurs that makes your heart sing. That's how I define it. The fact that your heart is beating, that is a song of the heart. So there is a miracle here right now. It's just a matter of making the connection. So what I've talked about just now allows you to make that connection very quickly. There is no first or last. Once you understand this concept that, you know, the fact that your heart is beating, that is a song of the heart, which means a miracle here, it's here right now. This stuff allows you to make that connection, okay? Um, now, if you were to look at right now, okay, and look at what's there in front of us that can make our heart sing, okay? So let's just look at, get some examples of that, you know? For me, just looking at all of you really engaged and really I can see the light bulbs going on, I can see the dots being joined, that's wonderful, it's making my heart sing. You know, what else is there for you? Children. Children, okay, great. What else? That right, is, come, come even closer. Yeah, come even closer to where you are. You know, come even closer. I mean, the, the print on your dress, that's beautiful, right? You know, we are sitting here comfortably. I, the temperature in the room. No, I found also like a miracle is when just a lot of folks are having pure feelings. Isn't that amazing? I, I have to tell you, when I've seen a group of individuals having pure feelings within their team dynamics or in their work, I see magnificent things emerging from that vibration. 
exactly. which even if we had all the intellectual abilities, it wouldn't happen. But these feelings, these pure feelings are making things happen. Yeah, and we are here in the presence of that. that right now. We, we actually put this together in just a few days um, when, when Minu told me she was coming and we've been on travel. And I think that we come together because it's a miracle of love and because I trust her and that I have these feelings that we just have an understanding things will work out. And I yeah. think the miracles happen from that. Yeah. And I don't know if you all even knew, know how we met, but I had gotten a call from Reverend Wilkins from Agape in L.A. And it turned out that Reverend Wilkins was the one that also connected me to Oprah Winfrey a few years ago. And it always surprises me how she keeps me in her heart somewhere where she can position me to do something that's miraculous. You got that? Yes. Reverend Wilkins trusts me. Yeah. She knows what we're made of. And she knows where to put us when it's important. Mm. So Reverend Wilkins um, was at our retreat in Peace Village, I think. And she had said, Sister Jenna, I told Minu about you. I really want you guys to meet. I think it'll be important. Um, now, Minu doesn't know this, but she was to have held a, 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 a forum in India this year in February. And I had booked my ticket ahead of time to get there. And the forum had been postponed for a later date. But I never told her, this is her first time hearing, that I actually wasted that ticket. Oh, my God. <laughs> but anyway, long story short, no, no, no worries. I say I love you still. We're still yes. together. Long story short, um, I'm in India now. Okay, and another friend of mine, Stephen Powers, contacts me and says, Sister Jenna, I really need to connect you with Minu. I go, who is this Minu? Everyone keeps telling me about this Minu. Sure enough, Stephen connects me to Minu, and Minu and I connect on an email, and I think two days later, Minu comes from Delhi to meet me in Mount Abu, India. I happen to be in Delhi. I mean, you know, I don't live there, but I happen it to be there. It just turned out that way. We connected and had a beautiful time. We took her around the facility. She met with Sister Shivani. She met with Sister Maureen. She met with Daddy, Daddy, Janky, Daddy yes. Janky. And we just stayed connected. Now, make a long story short, we've been just kind of going back and forth with each other. Mina was on the America Meditating Radio, which I'm sure every one of you are listening to every day. <laughs> and um, her idea of this World Dignity Forum that in order to create a sustainable future, people have to model their dignity now. And then so this grand idea of creating this World Dignity Forum has been birthing through her. And now she has it at a point where we're going to be hosting it in at the Taj Palace. Is that what it's called? It's called the Taj Diplomatic Enclave. They've changed the palace to Diplomatic Enclave. OK, in Delhi, uh, in, f in, in February of next year. and. Um, her friend, Joni, who's also traveling with her, they're traveling all over to get the right voices in this conference and in this forum. So I want you to talk a little bit about that. The reason why is this is so true. Remember about two, three weeks ago, we had, um, oh, wow, this is way too many data in my intellect right now. No, um, on dignity, when we spoke on dignity. No, who was the, the brother who was here? Oh my God, and I know him. Camilo. And we're close. Camilo. Camilo. That's what happens. <laughs> so about three weeks ago, Camilo is here. And Camilo has just retired from the World Bank. And his whole agenda now in his retirement is to move the energy and the conversation of dignity forward. Oh my God. Because he believes that if the world does not become aware of the importance of every human being modeling their dignity, there is no future. Now, something that came out very powerfully was that after he has hosted many global conversations, he realized that one of the most challenging things when he met with world leaders to see what they can do to help to uplift people's dignity was that world leaders felt very disconnected from seeing what they could do to help people raise their dignity until they were asked a personal question. When did you ever feel that your dignity wasn't respected? Then came a plethora of, of, of stories. Oh, well, then this happened, that happened. Yeah. Another thing that came out of the conversation was, in order for us to have a culture of dignity, that it's so imperative that you say sorry. 
when you're wrong. Because the person will walk around for the rest of their lives feeling that you didn't hear or value what their worth or their presence was for you. I can tell you how much it continues, but having a World Forum on Dignity, a World Dignity Forum, by the way, you can hashtag it when you share it on your social media today, World Dignity Forum, because we want to get this conversation out. How do we raise our dignity? So Minu and her friend Joni and a lot of individuals that are involved are looking at hosting this wonderful event next year. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. You know, when I connected to what the calling of my soul is and this whole miracle, um, connecting humans and humanity to the miracle that we are came about. Um, and, you know, in, in that little exercise that we just did, just to complete that piece and how the World Dignity Forum came about is in those, just in, in a few moments, we had so many things that we came up with that were stuff that would make our hearts sing. So you're connecting to miracles. There are at least, so there are so many moments in one second. There are at least 60 seconds in a minute. And there are at least, you know, 60 minutes in an hour and so on. So when we start focusing our attention on this whole miracle piece and looking at what's there right now that makes a heart sing, it creates a, a richness of such an abundant life that we already have right here, right now. You know, and it multiplies from that. And that, again, a big key to self-liberation. So I embarked on, wow, this is, this is self-liberating. And I just thought, I've got, my gig is to connect the seven billion people and more to this. I became very aware that what I am to bring forth is a full spectrum well-being solution, where you're thriving physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, socially, and environmentally. And as I worked in this arena, over the last several years, I found that I was achieving some real success, but it wasn't sustainable. You know, it would shifts would happen, big shifts would happen, and then people would start sliding back again. And I realized that actually there's something that more foundational that needed to be uncovered. And at the foundation I found was dignity. So if dignity is compromised in any way at all, then whatever, whatever we do, which might be really uplifting, it's not sustainable. So dignity has to be addressed as a foundational thing. And that, so it was like, okay, if I'm about reaching the world and making a difference to the world and making my own contribution into that, how, how do we address this whole dignity issue in a way that doesn't box me into feeding a few children here or you know, dealing with women empowerment there, and then you suddenly become only confined to those little projects. There are many amazing organizations doing the work. How do we leverage what is happening and give them an amplification in such a way that people start doing it for themselves? That was the question I put it out to spirit. And I was given the vision of creating the World Dignity Forum as a conscious counterpart to the World Economic Forum. And at that scale, at that level, lifting dignity from fringe to mainstream to actually center stage and bringing together world leaders, mobilizing global corporations and institutions to come in, not to talk about the fact that dignity is an issue, it just is an issue, but actually grounding it with real solutions that are being implemented. And there are some amazing solutions. So in my journey over the last two years, I've been traveling the world and meeting some amazing people. You know, really look, these are, I call them solutionaries, <laughs> uh, who are implementing these full spectrum solutions, addressing different aspects of what makes our world really work. So the World Dignity Forum is, has, is, has become a platform where the event, the three-day event, 8th, 9th, 10th of February, is the date in the calendar. And it gets inaugurated in 2019 in India. But it is a global happening that, that brings these leaders together. The idea is there's a build-up to it. There's a follow-through that happens. People are sharing their solutions. We are activating and invoking in in energetic ways what is being talked about by bringing in wisdom keepers from around the world to be there. 
um, really creating an eclectic mix in the audience of young people, youth, business leaders, spiritual leaders, leaders from arts and entertainment, philosophers, scientists, coming in, sharing these, these solutions. Uh, and um, what we arrived at is our Dignity Declaration. And we are inviting people to sign up to this Dignity Declaration. And our Dignity Declaration is to honor, build, and preserve dignity in self, in communities, which includes all inhabitants, and the environment with kindness, respect, and cooperation for a peaceful, sustainable, and abundant world. It's funny, because when we're in the office, um, Minu and Joni just said, we need to hold the World Dignity Forum at the National Museum of African American History. And everyone in the office just got goosebumps, like, yes. What better place to stamp that conversation in the US Absolutely. than there? And we happen to have been there yesterday with quite a number of friends who are all accomplished in the African American community. And we walked through the halls from slavery to the jubilation of arts and music and dance and culture. And we just left knowing that goodness and dignity is the bedrock of civilization, of not only our present, but of our future. And anything that doesn't connect to human dignity isn't truth. Any conversation, any choice, any rules, any laws that doesn't support the upliftment and dignity of a whole person isn't real, and it isn't truth, and it can't be blessed. And so I invite everyone today, and those listening in as well, and please, as you go home, you will go to Meditation Museum Facebook and share it with your friends. We need to get behind something that invites the whole world. It's very hard to, to initiate a program anymore unless it's specific. If you're not pushing women's issue, I don't want to hear it. If you're not pushing the environment, the environment, please, I don't, the world dignity, that's too generic. No, every person needs to model their dignity now, now more than ever. So, you know, I, I sit here thinking as you're speaking that there has to come a point in time that we just get behind something good. Hmm. Sometimes drop all of our balls of us trying to start our own things. Just get behind something good. I was in California recently and I was meeting with my friend Trina Wyatt. Please visit Conscious Good Media. And Trina Wyatt is pushing out media that basically supports what you watch is who you are. Mm -hmm. So she only wants to bring onto the platform positive stuff, things that are uplifting, things that are triumphant, things that really make you into a better human being. And we had a moment, one of those aha moments, and we sat and looked at each other. And I told Trina, I said, Trina, honestly, I just want to be behind the scenes. I don't want to be in front anymore. And she said, you know what? I really just want to support something that's important now. I don't need to push my company. My company's fine. And there's a feeling, if you're really listening to your heart, you'll feel like there's something calling all of us to do something right within, and to be right within, and to see where that supports on the greater cause. And I'm just inviting everyone to keep thinking about that. You know, I think about the museum's work, and I just wait for that one person to just come forward and say, I believe in this work, and I'm going to push this forward. Do you know what I mean? We have a lot of people. I'm just saying, there's always that one voice that says, let me help you and they can push the ball forward so much. So I think that Minu has tapped into something very powerfully, and I think the World Dignity Forum is very timely. And I know we're coming to a closure of our conversations, because there's a lot to do, and there is a question that somebody raised, and I would like to meet with them after the session, if that's okay. Um, and it's the one about your child that you lost recently. So can I talk to you afterwards? I would love to have be in private with you for that. Having the loss of a child cannot feel very liberating. It can feel like a nightmare. So the meaning of self-liberation, self how would you answer that? What does self-liberation mean? The meaning mean? of self-liberation is the meeting of self. The meaning of self-liberation is really truly meet, meeting yourself. Mm. You know, and 
we talked about the World Dignity Forum, and I shared the declaration of dignity, which is to honor, build, and preserve dignity in self, communities, and the environment with kindness, respect, and cooperation for a peaceful, abundant, and sustainable world. And it's a wonderful question you've asked because what we asked ourselves, this is an all-encompassing thing. And yes, the World Dignity Forum is going to be presenting solutions on all of these areas. How do we make it real for ourselves right now? How do we you know, have, have a solution for ourselves right now? And that gave rise to us, and this is my closing invitation to all of you, that gave rise to us creating a Dignity Pledge. And we invite each one of you and everybody listening and watching to take this Dignity Pledge, which is to take one act of kindness every day to honor, build, and preserve dignity in yourself. For dignity begins with me. I thank love you. that. That's simple. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to honor some of the questions asked. Do you have any suggestions on how someone can help to end addiction? Um, the B, to stop that addiction that's not serving them anymore. Do you have a B word that we can walk away with that can help to stop addiction? You know, um, I have suffered in the past from food addiction myself. Right? and um, coming out the other side. And one of the things that actually propels addiction is that feeling of lack, you know, like you, you, something, you're, something is missing and you, you find something to fill that space. So what I have found, and I've done this work with many, many people around addiction of different kinds, what I have found is this whole idea of knowing that you own your own miracle lens, and that you live, use that miracle lens to look at the world. Use that as your lens to look at the world. And you start finding so many things at every moment that really can make you feel enriched, can help you feel um, appreciative, can make you smile. It starts to create a fullness and an, and, 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 and a knowingness about how rich and abundant life is. And that's where your focus and attention goes. We give so much attention. Remember, whatever you give energy to, you get more of. We give so much attention. If, if we have someone in our loved one space where they are, there is an addiction issue, we give so much attention to being really worried about it that we get, they give us more things to worry about. Really what they want is for us to connect to the magnificence that they really possess, you know, rather than add to their own stress, which is leading them to addiction, by adding a worry to it. I kind of like you're giving us a miracle lens. Find your miracle lens. Yeah. What's your lens of miracle look like? When you look through that lens, how do you expect the miracle to unfold? That's great. So in other words, how do you see that miracle in this situation taking place? That's a, that's a great one, I think. Okay, last question. Can you explain the crown chakra connection mm -hmm. um, between throat, heart, and the other chakras that you mentioned? Especially the connection with throat and heart. Could you explain that a little bit more? Yes. Um, so I'm going to explain it in the way I, under I understood it in, in, like, I call it plain English, because I wasn't, I came from a corporate world into this suddenly all this knowledge which I had to decipher and make sense of. So the crown chakra is your connection to cosmic wisdom. That's what happens. And a throat is the, the chakra that supports your communication and heart is the one that really connects you to the innate vibration of being human. When a human chooses to be, the human being is love. That is the innate vibration of being love. That's the heart chakra. The heart chakra connects you to being in love. The throat chakra is the communication, and the, and the crown actually is the gatherer of cosmic wisdom. And in between, you have your third eye, which is the one that, is, that connects you to your own, own inner wisdom. So um, you can really begin in any direction. I really find 
getting all the, the alignment breaths that we did earlier on, literally align all three very powerfully. And you get into your center. If you're having too much input from your crown chakra and you haven't actually got aligned, your mind doesn't know what to do with it. It gets very overwhelmed and very conflicted. And literally, there are many, many people out there because you know we've heard that the energy of the earth is shifting, veils are thinning, all sorts of language is being used. So there are many people who are really conflicted. It's like you know you're, you've got one foot in, multi, in, in both camps and experiencing splits, like you're being torn apart. That's this, this over input into the crown chakra. So that input is happening because cosmic wisdom, which is new wisdom for this new energy force that is you know, uh, coming into the earth is happening. It's important to get into alignment. So then the nine, four, six breaths is a very powerful way of getting alignment. When you do that, you start connecting to the nowness of your heart. And as that alignment breath practice continues, so you know, what, what I do is I wake up in the morning and I have three sets of 10 946 breaths with five regular breaths in between. You don't have to breathe like this all the time, it's too much. You know, you'll be just in your center all the time and no, no doing will happen. Go out of balance in the other direction. But doing it first thing in the morning <laughs> just really keeps you in your center and just powerfully you know, gets your heart spinning right and your communication starts to come from a centeredness, as opposed to you sometimes speaking because of the overwhelm in your mind and even wondering why the hell did you just say this, right? Um, so once you understand what the functions are of these chakras, you have a, a very practical practice of aligning yourself, then have the trust in your own knowing. If, if it's okay, um, I think for some of us who are very conceptual and not sometimes abstractual, um, the, the, for me, and I don't know too much knowledge about chakras, I tend to stay away from a lot of that. Um, I understand that chakra, since it's the crown chakra, for me to pay attention to more of my thoughts that are connected to purity, peace and power, and truth and wisdom. So when my energy is aligned to expanding the quality of the vibration of peace and purity, I feel like my crown chakra is getting much brighter. And I think what the throat also symbolizes is my ability to articulate and communicate clearly. Clearly, with respect, with honesty, purity, humility. And if I'm not communicating from that level, then it's like my, my throat is blocked. Or my, I can't speak what I really want to feel, or or I'm scared to speak up because I'm I, I'm not I don't know what you'll say. And so you know, if I'm not one of the greatest aspects of moving our lives forward is to be able to articulate our stories clearly to people without too much emotions, because you find that when you communicate with a lot of emotions, we can create a lot of enemies or we can create too many people who are in need of our time and energy. Thus, we don't get a chance to spend enough time for ourselves. So I think when we're, when we're doing these exercises to help with the crown and the throat chakra, in addition to that alignment of the physical practice of the energy, we must pay attention to what these thoughts are saying. Where am I feeding them? And I think they will open up energies in the soul and also close things that I don't need to. Haven't you ever been in a room where the space feels very negative and you just block off and you yeah. go, I'm not gonna take that in? It's like you make a choice to do that. And when you get into an energy space that feels really safe, you're like, oh gosh, just bathe me. I just want all of this for me. So you can see how we open and close ourselves. So in the same way, I think the chakra is also um, sort of signal to us, how much do I need to be open? What kind of a thoughts do I need to use here? How do I need to articulate? When you were mentioning the, the gut, I was remembering Ganesh, <laughs> because Ganesh has this big belly, you know, and Ganesh digests wisdom, and he's known to be the one that really helps you to be very wise as you move along. Well, I know we have to come to a close. I'm so sorry about that. Did you guys enjoy this? Yes. Was it useful? Good. Let's give her a big hand of applause. Thank you. Did you bring any books to sign? Um, we actually did not have the consignment arrive in time, so these books are available on Amazon. You can go on, on Amazon. This is the Indian edition of it, which you may not get here in the U.S., but you'll certainly get that. It's available 
um, online as well, on, on electronically as well, so okay. you can buy that online. We have some material on the World Dignity Forum for those of you who are interested in How about seeing this? more. Um, we will have you in the back, mm -hmm. and then only those who are really interested in really moving the story forward, feel free to meet um, Minu in the back and engage in further dialogue to see in what way we can maybe move a narrative forward in our area or elsewhere. How's that? Good? All right, so give her a big hand of applause again. Thank you so much. So I think we'll close off, you're welcome. And now we'll have a closing meditation with Sister Jenna. And again, great. thank you all for coming, and we appreciate your support. Thanks, Antonia. So I'll just do a meditation. And at the end, I'll be giving up blessing cards to everyone. So if you'll just have a moment of love exchange to the eyes, then just come on up at the front of the stage, and I'll be able to assist. All right, so take a deep breath. Inhale, and um, keep yourselves settled. For the last hour and a half, there's been loving thoughts and ideas shared. Each one of us are on our own individual journey. And truthfully, none of us is alone. If you really listen, if you really listen deeply, Something deep inside of you must be signaling you. Wake up. Find your power. Be clear. So for this moment, let's break away from our familiar stories. What would my life be like if I just stopped taking everything so personally? thinking that I'm alone, blaming people, expecting too much from others. What would my life be like if I stopped thinking in this way? The only thing that I choose to take personally are virtues, values, the quality of the human spirit. For a little while, imagine yourself in the 10th row of a theater, looking at your life. What's your movie like? What's your drawing room? Comedy, documentary, is it sci-fi, adventure? <laughs> What's your movie like? You're just an observer of your story. Imagine you can't rewrite the script, but you can add a part two, a part three, even a part four to it. What would you write into that story? What would your character be like? The director tends to focus a lot on the quality of your eyes, the beauty in your smile, the expression of your emotions. So in your part two, what would you write? What's the part that you would want to play? What's the miracle that you wish to live? that can move you closer to being a liberated you. A 
I'd like to invite you to just pause in silence. And settle inwards. Quietly. From this place of silence, send your pure feelings to the people close to you. And send your wishes of benevolence to those who have harmed you or hurt you in some way. And wish them well. Let them know that they don't need to be a part of your story anymore. Other than I just wish you well. And observe how much it heals you and frees you to be able to have pure feelings to those that hurt you. How big it makes you. How much you feel your dignity returning to you. So with a deep breath, breathe in deeply and exhale. Breathe in love and acceptance and exhale anything that is of the past that no longer serves you. Just with your mind, give a big Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Om Shanti. I release you. I bid you farewell. I'm free.